director of the Palo Alto Art Center. And I'm really pleased to see you all here this evening for this very special talk by artist Yulia Pinkusevich in connection with our exhibition, Where the Heart Is, Contemporary Art by Immigrant Artists. I am so excited to share that the exhibition is up and on view at 25% capacity through April 3rd. It was great to see Yulia in the space yesterday. I sincerely hope that you will all be able to see the show during its run. I also want to remind you all that Yulia's work is also included in a solo, solo show at Qualia Contemporary Art Gallery in Palo Alto that I hope that you'll be able to see as well. So it's all about Yulia in Palo Alto right now. Um, before I introduce Yulia, I would like to thank the supporter of this exhibition, the National Endowment for the Arts. I would also like to thank the members and donors of the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation who make free programs and exhibitions possible for the community. Thank you. I, I encourage you, if you're not a member, to consider joining the Art Center Foundation and supporting our work. Uh, Yulia Pinkusevich is an artist and educator born in the Ukraine. Upon the collapse of the Soviet Union, her family fled the Eastern Bloc as refugees, emigrating to New York City. She holds a Master of Fine Arts degree from Stanford University and a BFA from Rutgers, uh, Mason Gross School of the Arts, graduating both universities with the highest honors. She's exhibited nationally and internationally, including site-specific projects executed in Paris and Buenos Aires. Her work is in the public collections of the De Young Memorial Museum, a recent acquisition too, which is very exciting. Um, Facebook headquarters, Google headquarters, and City of Albuquerque. And she's been awarded residency grants from Gray Arts Foundation, Wildlands, Lucid Arts Foundation, Autodesk Pier 9, Recology, uh, Cité des Arts International, and Headland Center for the Arts, amongst others. Uh, Yulia will take questions at the end, but please feel free if you've got a question during her talk to put it in the chat um, and we'll address those at the end of the talk. And welcome, Yulia. Thank you so much for being with us here this evening. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a great honor and pleasure of mine to, to speak with you today and share some of my work. I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I just want to echo Karen's uh, invitation to visit the show in person. It's really a stunning group show and there's lots of amazing work in, in there. And it's just so energizing and refreshing to see art in person again. So it was it was a very nice visit yesterday and I, I hope you get a chance to stop over. Um, well, so I guess let me share my screen. That look okay to everybody? Cool. Okay. Um, Calm under the wave in the blue of my oblivion. This is the, the title for the talk and also the title for um, a virtual exhibition I also currently have up right now that is part of um, Archer Gallery at Clark University, Clark College in Washington. And so I'm gonna start with this Francis Bacon painting that was kind of influential to me as a young artist. Um, as Karen mentioned, I mostly was raised in New York and I used to go and visit this piece. Um, maybe, you know, I usually don't talk so much about this piece, but, but I just wanna mention the thing that's really specific about this painting that is important to me is the, you the viewer and the placement of the viewer, we are inside of this cage with this baboon, right? Like the baboon is next to us. And I think that's something to keep in mind. So um, I'm gonna just talk about a moment in my life that felt profound. Perhaps you've also had a point in exchange or a site you see. And this is how I arrived at um, some of the work that I'm gonna share with you today. So back in 2007, I spent a couple of months living in Argentina. And before leaving Buenos Aires, I decided to go to the local zoo. I was just staying around the corner from there. And at the zoo, I encountered an orangutan in a cage um, whose name was Sandra. 
she was sitting in this cage looking really sad and kind of devoid of life, just really listless. And people would come by and take photos and try to wave and leave and nothing seemed to phase her. She just looked really detached. And I stood around drawing her a little bit. And, and then I witnessed something kind of interesting happen. The zookeeper came by and started washing the glass. And she, the orangutan, Oh, sorry, that was my cat trying to jump on my computer. I'm sorry. The orangutan um, decided to, oh, the, the orangutan recognized the zookeeper and locked eyes with him and just like really transformed her expression. And the zookeeper explained to me in Spanish and from what I can understand that she was kind of being grounded for fighting. So she was locked in this cage. But this transformation, this like animal just completely came to life. And watching this emotional transformation, it really affected me. When I got back to New York, I started seeing that same devoid look in people's eyes. And it made me really reflect a lot on captivity of the mind and what the state of psychological entrapment really means. I also started thinking about the structures that surround us and define and influence our actions and possibly even our thoughts. Is the built environment a physical map of our psyche? And I put this picture in here because at the time I was working at Christie's, the auction house in New York City on 6th Avenue or Avenue of the Americas. And when I would go out for lunch, this is what I would see. Just these huge, you know, buildings and this little sliver of sky. So these were the first drawings that I made which focused on the psychology of space and mental captivity. They were depicting that perspective from the cage. I was really trying to embody that animal's kind of reality in some ways. And I intentionally started working with charcoal and beeswax on paper monochromatically, choosing to reduce my work to its essential elements. The compositions became abstract places, um, maybe spaces, not really places that exist, but they were evolving and opening up and started to explore infinities of the mind. Now, drawing has led me to consider surface and architecture is just another surface. So as my work evolved, I became interested in art as a visual experience. And I usually work alone and have become accustomed to the solitude, feeling pretty stifled when being watched as I work. As a method to conquer this fear, I decided to expose the process to the public. It's not too loud. And um, maybe I naturally arrived at, perform at this performative process because as a child, I spent 10 years studying classical ballet dancing for three seasons at Lincoln Center in New York. And um, ultimately I gave up dance as a teenager to focus my efforts on visual art. But years later, through the vehicle of drawing, I love that I could find expression through the body again. So there's this nice connection between drawing performance and dance for me. And this is a piece in Santa Fe. Um, you can still see it today. It's uh, Art Center in Santa Fe. And I had to learn how to climb <laughs> for this piece. Um, conceptually, my work focuses on fragmented visions of architectural layering and psychological perceptions of our built environment. Um, as a child, I lived during a time of deep uncertainty and massive restructuring. In the early 80s, when I was born, the USSR was going through a political movement called Perestroika, which was initiated to create massive reform and save communist ideology from failure. This piece kind of deals with the, um, with some of these political undertones. The USSR propagated communism through art design and art architecture, and this mural utilizes a politi politicized visual language to challenge established political structures. Formally, my work engages with a direct experience of the viewer through perspective, illusion, and spatial perceptions that play with your understanding of space. This is a mural at Facebook headquarters in your Menlo Park office. 
this is a piece called Silencing the Cacophony. Um, I made it in 2015, and it utilizes the aesthetics of protest and media depictions of resistance to capture the energy and feeling of people's uprisings around the globe. I really, I really enjoy working with familiar and easily accessible materials, partly to create impactful work wherever I go. This piece is made with, as well as most of the other murals you saw, with chalk, charcoal, paint, and this piece also utilizes salt. I really like to challenge myself, or I try <laughs> to challenge myself by taking on projects that are unlike anything I've done before. This was a collaborative project with Glenna Cole Alley, and it used over 2000 donated books to build a structure. And it was really important for me not to damage any of the books in the process while making it structurally sound. We had a number of um, performances happen in the space and you can kind of walk in and out. And I really didn't want the thing to collapse on anyone. And we managed to make it nice and strong. Um, and all the books were donated after the show. So they're still in circulation somewhere. Not everything I do is impermanent. Obviously I like working with um, installations. And this is a public art commission at Stanford University, McMurtry Art and Art History Building. This piece is titled Sima, and it's actually, uh, it's a sculptural seating, I should say, made out of local redwood, and it's situated in the atrium of the Diller Scafidio and Renfro Design Building, who is an architecture firm, I think is fantastic. And uh, I really love to see my art put to use in all kinds of ways. And so this is kind of fun to see somebody send me this picture. Sorry, it's a little grainy, but just kids hanging out on it. And apparently it's a popular location <laughs> in the building. Um, so if you do find yourself at Stanford, this is in the public atrium. So it's even during COVID, this is open to the public and you can come hang out in the lobby, check out the new building. So in 2019, I was invited to create an installation at SF State University. And this was during a time when the news was flooded with talk about the border wall. So I created a wall made of about 1600 pounds of salt. Over the course of the exhibition, the spring rains dissolved this wall and only a few scraps of the bricks remained. So here you can see how it collapsed on the left and then melted away predominantly over the rains. So the picture on the right is what remained at the end of the exhibition. Um, a local art critic named Kelly Kirkland wrote that the gradual decomposition of a wall, a structural symbol for defense, takes on an explicitly political tone against the backdrop of the current political discourse surrounding immigration. Border walls create some of the most hostile built environments that exist seeing a symbol of isolationism subjected to the daily microaggressions of water and wind, viewers are prompted to imagine the process of dismantling similar structures of detainment and containment on a broader scope. And I thought it was a nice way to summarize the ideas in that work. So I mentioned I really like working on site and in the summer of 2019, while I was an artist in residence at Wildlands in Healdsburg, California, not too far from us here in the Bay Area, I was very inspired by the serenity of that place and the California oak forests. And as a, as a ritualistic practice, I hike daily, not only to spend time in the forest, but also to collect oak galls, which are quite ubiquitous, I'm sure a lot of you. If you have an oak tree, a valley oak, there's probably a gall on it <laughs> or a few. Um, so oak galls, maybe some of you know, but uh, they're, they're also called oak apples and they grow on certain valley oaks as a result of a parasitic wasp laying its larva in the oak twigs. The wasp larva secretes a hormone so similar to the oak's own, the oak will grow a gall as a way to both excrete the parasite and protect the larva. This common solistic relationship really spoke to me. The gall is both the result of an irritant, but also gives the wasp an offering of food and shelter. The galls are, are starch, made of starch, so they're 
they provide food. This installation contemplates this complex relationship, which for me not only speaks to the interdependent living systems we're all a part of, but it also symbolizes a poetic way to embrace the difficulties of life, right? There's wisdom in these trees. And, and um, I was very lucky to work with this um, 500 year old oak tree on the property. And I suspended 108 red oak galls with cotton string. And from some perspectives, you could see the shape of two arches or brows, which were meant to mirror um, a statue that was placed underneath this smaller tree right across from the cottage where I was staying. Um, it was a Buddha head and it had these really serene Buddha brows and there's something really inspiring about that. So this one, you could really see how the Gauls draw the brows and the tree becomes the Buddha in some way. The landscape becomes the view through those eyes. And I should mention that I believe um, this property actually was affected by the fires we had this past fire season. And apparently this tree is recuperating. It's still alive, but it is um, kind of devastating to think that this property has been hit by fire. Um, okay, so later that year, I developed an installation using salt and oak galls again. So I was a member of the Experiential Space Research Lab at Great Area Arts Foundation, which is kind of a performance art space. Um, and they do all kinds of things. They're, they're also a theater. It was funded by the Knight Foundation and a group of 11 artists, scientists, designers, and architects were tasked with creating an immersive installation about Earth's living systems. The exhibition was titled, This Will Be the End of You. And so there were seven exhibits and this one was my exhibit and I had a couple of um, collaborators working on the sound, the audio meditations and the visuals you see in the back. It took place in February, 2020, just before COVID lockdown, just, yeah. And when you could still lay down next to a stranger and it not feel weird. Um, so it, this exhibition is titled The Luxuriant Prolific Undying. And it explores the nature of personhood and the personhood of nature, challenging and expanding perceptions of persons and how they are understood. Another way you can think about it is so our non-human kin. Who are they? Visitors were invited to stay and listen to two versions of a guided meditation created in collaboration with Spherical Studio and projections by Stephen Standridge these kind of beautiful animated projections. This installation aimed to dissolve one's ego by confronting the impermanence of life. You can check out the full audio on my website and they're, they're really great. One is five minute meditation, one's about 11 minutes and um, it's kind of from the perspective of the trees, if you will. It's pretty great, I think. <laughs> Um, so here's some more shots of people laying under the alder root and you can actually be underneath the root and these were trees sourced locally so this was a red alder which is kind of an auspicious tree and has been used in a lot of ritual you know, in various cultures and the other tree was a incense cedar which came from Mills College where I am a professor so they're both local and um, the incense cedar actually still has this amazing smell. And this is just a quick shot of um, kind of the, you got to sit on these cedar slabs and while well, you listen to the meditation or lay under the tree. And so um, curiously, while I was working on that project, end of you, I learned that Sandra the orangutan, who I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, actually became the first non-human animal recognized as a person in a court of law. And she was finally moved to a sanctuary in Florida last year. And to me, this was remarkable. I mean, you know, it was just a visit to the zoo and somehow it sparked this, this journey for me. And ultimately this animal, you know, affected many people, not just me because there, it sparked enough desire for people to, to free this, to free this individual. And I mean, in a way, she's in part responsible for me being here in front of you today. So, you know, what non-human person has done that for you? 
So I'm going to just shift gears a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of an overview of my practice. And now I'm going to talk about some drawings. Um, specifically, you know, I really enjoy creating installations, but they're very labor intensive and demanding. And so I lean on drawing as a foundational practice, which not only contributes to my site specific work, but gives me an opportunity to create more personal work. I start with the simplest of tools, charcoal and paper. To me, this simplicity has a certain ease, yet its immediacy is impactful. The more I push my process, the more complex my drawings become. Um, for me, drawing is a primal childlike pleasure. It can be a pause, but it can also be a great release, a channeling of energy and emotion or a translation of a feeling. The physical act is demanding, requiring focus and energy, not unlike a dance. I kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, these works on paper that I just showed you the last couple pieces um, are from a series titled Isorhythm, um, which I've been making since 2018. The series grew out of a collaborative project called Double Vision with Francois Hughes and Andrea Steves. Um, that was kind of more of like a social practice installation with audio. So, but, the, but through my research, I kind of stumbled on some material that started to um, develop these drawings from that. These drawings aim to capture the energy of a place. Some details showing you some of those marks. I draw on my personal experience growing up in the USSR at the end of the Cold War, as well as the ever increasing tension of our current political climate um, to create charcoal and ink marks made by gestures and physical movement that react to and synthesize the complex relationship these two, between these two countries. And this is the piece that's now in the collection of the DM. And you can see a number of these works at Qualia Contemporary in Palo Alto on University right now. Um, oh, I should mention that the word isorhythm, the title for the piece, is borrowed from musicology. It's a Greek, Greek origin, meaning the same rhythm. It's a musical technique using a repeating rhythmic pattern throughout a composition. It was first used to describe 13th century French motets and hopefully the rhythm in um, the drawings kind of hold a little bit of that musicality. And this is a installation view at Qualia Contemporary. I hope you get a chance to stop by. It's very close to the Apple store on university. Okay. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the body of work at Palo Alto Art Center, but I'm gonna just give you a little bit of background and I'm gonna let this video play while I talk and then I'll explain why you're seeing or watching this. Um, well, at the start of 2020, we all had a lot of plans, moving fast, going places, doing things, and I was no different. Suddenly, things changed, and here we are a year into this pandemic. We're still being asked to stand still, and I've been reflecting on this newfound stillness in the world and in my life the past year. Um, I hesitate to admit that in many ways, I've taken some solace in this found stillness. For me, it's been about 10 years since I've been running nonstop, you know, working with no breaks. And like many of you, I crammed a lot of things into my life. As I began to slow down last spring, I also found time to look inwards, going deeper to learn more about where I come from and who my ancestors are. So much of it was lost through immigration, through war, politics, death. Most of what I knew was recent history, dating back a generation or two maps. And I'm showing you these videos um, because these acrobats are actually my great uncles on my mother's side. So this is Boris and Vladimir Voronin. And they were identical twins and became famous acrobats with the Moscow Circus. They toured internationally during 
um, the Eastern Blockade, and they even appeared in a couple of Soviet films, such as this one called Two Hours Earlier from 1966. And this is their, their signature move where one brother balances on his arms and the other one balances on his head. So I'm just gonna let you check it out. I'm the special effects very charming too. <laughs> so um, I actually only met those uncles once when we stayed with them in their Moscow apartment as my parents finalized all the paperwork for our immigration to America. And just very recently, my father found this INS card. It was issued to me on the first day we came to the US. I was, you know, I was pretty young. You could see in the photos, just, just about to turn nine. Um, it was taken at JFK Airport in New York shortly after I took my first flight over the Atlantic. But finding this document, what really struck me is this stateless status you could see. Um, and, you know, I, I looked it up and, you know, it kind of says like an inter in international law, a stateless person is someone who's not considered a uh, national by any state under the operation of its laws. Some stateless people are also refugees. However, not all refugees are stateless and many people who are stateless have never crossed an international border. So just something interesting to consider. And likely we were given the status because we came as refugees from the Soviet Union. So I was born in the Soviet Union to a Siberian mother and a Jewish father. These are my mother's ancestors from Siberia. I know very little about them. My great grandfather Alexei and his wife Maria were veterinarians. They worked with animals and she's seen here as a child on the left. This photo is taken in 1909, just eight years before the communist revolution in 1917. The back of these photos have some dates and places listed. And it turns out that some of these Siberian family members came from Irkutsk which is down here, oh, Irkutsk Oblast, yeah. And then, um, and then right next to Lake Baikal, which you can see here, the largest freshwater lake in the world. And um, the other side was from a Northern region called Saha or Yakutia, which is right over here. Both places are known for its harsh climate and extreme landscapes. <laughs> Here's our obligatory artistic photo of some cold landscapes. Um, but actually, you know, it's not uh, always cold there. It's a very extreme place. So in the summer, it gets very hot, up to 40 degrees Celsius. And in the winter, it drops to negative 40. And so the, the, you know, the swings are just fairly extreme. And this is Lake Baikal, which is the largest and deepest freshwater lake in the world. It contains more water than all of North American Great Lakes combined. And it's home to hundreds of endemic species of plants and animals, as well as the only freshwater seal. And this is kind of a famous rock um, that is dubbed by locals as shaman rock. Now, both of these places are known as the heartland of shamanism in its classical form. Uh, a practice being revived in that region um, in recent years. I spent my childhood summers in Siberia with my grandparents, but because native Siberians were brought to the brink of extinction in the 19th century as white Russians moved in, very little indigenous culture remained 
especially by the time I was a child. And I should just mention that these are historic photos I found in a local um, museum in the area. And so these are, these are shaman practitioners. By the 1920s, Stalin purged whatever remained of shamanism in all other religions, causing a multi-generational amnesia about one's native heritage. This is a photo of a family of Buddha people from the Southern Siberian Lake Baikal region. And I just thought their costumes are really stunning. So due to the communist purge, people's, of people's sacred practices, beliefs and rituals were forgotten. Um, this amnesia afflicted my family as well, leaving only the remnants of strange superstitions. Um, this is more of those historical photos. And I really wanted to learn more and to better understand the indigenous histories, both in Russia and in the US. Through some of this anti-colonial research, I read Charles C. Mann's book called 1491, um, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. Through this book and subsequent articles, I discovered that in 2013, new evidence emerged, which links native Siberians to native Americans through mitochondrial DNA. I really recommend this book, um, which focuses on the Americas. It has helped me to begin to reframe my own Western colonial settler based education. And I'm working to unlearn these histories to become better informed about the more holistic history of our land one that includes indigenous cultures in the Americas and in Russia before the arrival of colonizers. And interestingly enough, just like superficially, the history of indigenous peoples in Russia, which you see um, a little bit in that photo below, and the history of American indigenous populations is sad, but actually similar. They were both kind of purged. And so um, based on some of this research and subsequent discoveries, I set out to create a series of drawings inspired by the Saha people's belief and rituals. Um, the Saha people are sun worshipers who embody animist based beliefs and practices. I also looked at historic art from the region focusing on petroglyphs and ceremonial objects. I felt it was important to pay homage to this ancient artists on my journey to rediscovering my ancestors. These are some beautiful petroglyphs in the area depicting what some people think are very early um, depictions of shamans in practice. And so this is the uh, photograph of my work at the Palo Alto Art Center, two, two works on paper. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through this body of work and the, the online exhibition at Archer as well. This was our digital gallery, virtual, virtual gallery. I really wanted to challenge myself and think a little bit about what we can do with a virtual gallery. And, you know, a cave is pretty much the worst place you could put works on paper. It's wet, it's dark, it's damp. And so this was kind of an opportunity to expand uh, where you can exhibit, right? Instead of just recreating a white, a white box space. So, like I said, I was seeking to reconnect with my lost heritage and contribute towards healing. Um, I began this body of work while in quarantine over the summer. And I found myself longing for unity and working to embrace feminine intuitions and symbols. And this is one of the works at the Palo Alto Art Center. It's, uh, this is a detail. So 
Traditionally, the Saka people are sun worshipers, as I mentioned, and their particular type of throat singing is amazing too. Check it out if you can. They can hold two tones at the same time, which is kind of mind blowing for me. Um, and they believe that three spirits reside in each human, the spirit of the earth, the spirit of the mother, and the spirit of the air. All of these enter the child at different moments in early life. And this particular drawing is about the spirit of the mother. And it's both based on the complex journeys of being a mother and the divine maternal energy, which is in all of us, regardless of your gender. So this is a detail. You can see some of those petroglyphs kind of making the rounds. And this is, um, this is a piece called, um, oh, sorry, my title is wrong here. It's actually the spirit of the air. Or I also think about it as in the voice or the breath. And this is the detail. Um, and I created this piece during the 2020 California fires, which really made me consider air in a different way. Not only reflecting on how fragile our shared atmosphere is, but how essential this is to all life. So it kind of took on a little bit of a dual meaning for me. So these are two other works in the series. This is a pretty new piece. Um, I actually finished in 2021. Sorry, my captions are a little off. Um, this is called The Path, or I sometimes refer to it as the Tree of Life. And for me, it's kind of about integrating disparate selves or embracing parts of yourself that you've maybe put aside or hide in private. This is um, the spirit of the earth. And it is kind of dealing with both the upper world and the lower world. And my, my daughter as a baby makes an appearance in it, which is kind of fun. Here's the detail of the bottom. So the last piece I'm gonna show you is this video. Um, Maybe I'll just let it play while we talk. It's a video I created a couple of years back. Um, an abstract piece. Oops. I'm just gonna, I just wanna leave you with some thoughts, some food for thought as you're watching this video, because it's, it's a little bit more of a passive watching experience. Um, we're living through demanding and troubling times. The intergenerational confusion, that's European colonialism, racism, misogyny, economic greed, and disconnection from the earth. These troubles continue to drive ecological collapse and tremendous suffering. At the same time, we each have wisdom we each have access to the wisdom of our ancestors who specialized in the medicine and their um, ethical and effective ways of influencing you. I guess I wanna know what you know about your ancestors. What was their relationship to the earth? Um, in shamanism, there's a belief that the cosmos is a series of layers our levels, and these levels are connected by vertical roots of access, flights through space, some people call them trees or magical ladders. Um, there's a, a lot of research on this and different people hold different ideas about it. But some people think that a shaman is an extraordinary human who has animal allies behind them and with their guidance is able to access these levels. Ethnographic documentations of Siberian beliefs show that the cosmos was multi veiled. Um, a common description is the three leveled structure, the upper, the middle, and the lower world. I ask you to hold this middle space in mind as you consider your own ancestors. 
their lives, their experiences, their joys, their traumas, their hardships, their pleasures. And now I want you to do a little time travel and imagine yourself alive, not in the present moment, but living a tribal life 100,000 years ago, standing in the high grass, not far from the open canopy forest from which you emerged. The grasses are tall, but you can see above them. What do you see? How do you spend your days? What is your relationship to the earth and our non-human? It's been helpful for me to kind of take this long view and to try to expand my own ideas and feelings about the story, you know, the stories of our families having some agency. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Yulia. How, how do we do on time? I think we do. We're doing great on time. Um, uh, quest any questions for Yulia, please um, feel free to unmute yourself or put your questions in the chat. Or comments, feedback, always fun to. Hi, Yulia. Hey, Sam. Good <laughs> to see you. <laughs> It's good to see your new works. Thanks. So I, I have a question. Um, so uh, so uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the artists in the exhibition is that many of them are pushing boundaries around media. And you have worked in such a wide range of media and, um, and it's really exciting to see the expansive media in your work in the talk today. Um, but a question for you, I think these are the first, this, the one work in the show, the mother spirit is the first figurative piece I think you've done, I've seen. Do you wanna talk about that? And then some of the other images that you've shown in that series, the image of your daughter. So you're actually including human figures in a way I've never seen before, which is exciting. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's been a complicated thing. And these works are kind of, they, they've been a bit of a pivot. You could see how it's kind of different from what I've been doing. And I think it has something to do with, well, I should say, you know, I'm a professor of art and I teach drawing and I love teaching figure drawing. It's something that I genuinely enjoy and have a pretty good understanding of. And, you know, I, because I worked with, I don't know, for a long time, I just felt like it wasn't my territory and I didn't, and I intentionally omitted figurative work. I mean, partly because I'm interested in scale, these grand scales and kind of big ways of moving through space. Um, but I think this year, and because of the quarantine and being so isolated, I just also, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a newish mom, my kid's three and a half years old. And I think that's really changed for me to kind of grappling with that shift in identity and, you know, thinking about my daughter too. And, and um, it's been, you know, I just, I just decided to embrace that kind of feminine a little bit more in my work and to allow, you know, it needed a figure. It, it, it was a story. They're, they're kind of journeys and they're stories about humans, right? And they're sort of stories about the idea of a person, but also in a way they're about all of us. And so I thought that the figure kind of grounded it and, you know, I, I used it where I needed it and I didn't where I didn't and hopefully it's okay. But <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a scary thing to do, Karen. That's a good point. Well, they're, they're very small figures too. So <laughs> it, you, know, it, you really do have to pay attention, but that, that's great. We've got a, we've got a comment um, in the chat from Tom Garvey. Um, a Grateful Dead reference, um, the ISA rhythms, all I could think about was the Grateful Dead song, Ripple. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I didn't go into a lot of detail about where those pieces came from, but um, that's that's great. You know, a lot of people really say they, they, they hear music when they see it. And um, 
I, you know, I created those pieces at an artist residency called Lucid Arts Foundation in Inverness, just in, in Marin, not too far from here, right? Right? Like it's it's a residency that is really isolated and you're there all by yourself. And I was there in May or June, I think. And there were just like tons of songbirds all through the forest. And I, you know, I was up on this big deck and I could hear all the songs of the birds and that somehow the rhythm of that natural sounds really contributed to how these drawings came about. So, so on the one hand, they're kind of dealing with like mapping and military, but on the other hand, they're very much about nature and energy and beauty. And so it's, yeah, it's a little complicated to talk about them because they really do kind of hold both of those aspects. Thanks, Tom, great, great comment. Oh, um, yeah, so the, the, the question about the last video, um, that, that video is, you know, it's like, it's sort of embarrassing to reveal your sources because sometimes they're really straightforward. It's, it's a, I filmed the ocean at the headlands. Like I was there on a hike and I did it with my cell phone. I probably shouldn't tell you all this. And I filmed it on my phone and there was just something kind of magical about the way the, the white foam and my perspective. And it just, it really struck me. And, and what's kind of amazing is that it looks very kind of supernatural or sci-fi, but it's the waves in real time. I didn't change the rhythm of the ocean. And so there is something kind of nice about having that you know, the rhythm of the ocean. I think we all, you know, we're all beings made of a lot of water. I think we like feel those things as being, you know, there's something very much about like the mm. rhythms of life and that. And, 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 but I, but I, when I made the video, I wanted to shift it to kind of look, you know, more like primordial. I was really thinking it was, a, it was made for a show about space and Mars and comets and things. And so it was about sort of like space dust or like, Somebody, what did somebody say last time? Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, you did an amazing job. I guess I'm just a pre, you know, I, I would say maybe in my mind, I'm so close to ink. So what I saw is like uh, the ink, it's just uh, moving the mo you know like uh, all this oh. movement of the ink and the water so it's just yeah. amazing <laughs> thank you yeah i think my graphic aesthetic um always comes through when we, i just love high contrast and i and i like you know working monochromatically often and um yeah i think that the ink is not by accident <laughs> <laughs> so yulia i have a question this is jim stinger hi jim you talked a little bit about the impermanence of your art. And I'm wondering how much you think about that impermanence as you go into a piece and start doing it and, and, and putting your energy into it and time, of course, and other resources. Do you, do you think at all about how this piece is, is not going to last very long in terms of, of, of the you know, timeline of, of life um, and how much that might influence what you do. Do you kind of let the piece talk to you as you go along or, you know, that, can you tell us a little bit about that sort of thing? Thank you for that question. It's a great question. And I'm glad you bring it up because it's um, my, my use of material is really specific. It's something I lament probably like, you know, to a point of <laughs> exhaustion um, because, well, one, you know, like art, you use material. And I think because um, a lot of my work is, you know, about the environment, I want to be conscientious of, you know, what I'm using and what I'm paying, you know, what I'm buying, what, what kind of industries I'm supporting. And initially I, you know, I started showing you some of these works with, on paper with charcoal and it was a, and then I started doing these wall drawings subsequently to that. You know, I trained as a painter. I have, you know, I also worked in sculpture. I, you know, I have different, you know, I used to make oil paintings. And, um, and I, well, partly it's probably because of my immigrant status. I moved a lot. We never really had a home that was my family home. I don't, 
have like a basement where I could store all my art things. Well, at least I didn't for many years of my life now, <laughs> which is nice. But um, I, I, um, I wanted to work with easily accessible materials and things that are familiar. Part of my kind of ethos in art making is to take something really familiar like charcoal or salt or paper or wax and try to kind of push it to a place that goes a little bit beyond what you're used to doing with it, right? So, you know, charcoal is just burnt wood and salt is something you put in your body every day. And, and you know, but there's still ways you can have these remarkable experiences with them. And, and to kind of pivot back to your, your question about tem temporary materials, I'm, you know, well, work on paper actually can last a very long time. And some of the most ancient art we have is made with charcoal. If you look at the caves, the cave paintings of Lascaux, for example, they chewed up charcoal, used their spit, right? And their hand as a stencil. And those are the most ancient pieces. So I, I do think that there's something about a contemporary art perspective that like works on paper seem futile or easy to, you know, discard, but Ultimately, if you preserve them, they can last a really long time. And then working on the wall drawings, I really wanted to create impactful work no matter where I went. And even if I was, you know, at a residency, I didn't have to bring an, an insane amount of things. And, and also, you know, Jim, part of that shift for me was when I was a kind of a young artist, um, right after my undergraduate, I, I got a job working at Christie's, the auction house. And I worked there from 2007 through 2008, I think, not a very long time, but it was during one of the booms in the market. And, you know, as a young artist, you walk through these galleries and you see all these pieces of art being sold for many millions of dollars often, right? And I remember watching a Warhol painting sell, sell for 72 million, which was a record at that time. Now, of course, it's been beat like twice over, but, um, and it, you know, as a young artist, just trying to get by, it really made me realize, A, that things that sell are not necessarily always good and good things don't necessarily always sell. And I wanted to kind of make a shift in my own work to create work that's about the experience of art to kind of like free it from the weight of the, the commodification of art, which can be really stifling for young artists, I think. And so it was very much a intentional choice to start working with like super cheap accessible materials working on walls, working on paper as a way to kind of, yeah, just as a way to make it more accessible for myself and also to, to try to maybe set an example that you don't need a lot of equipment, a fancy studio to make good work, right? You could just make the work. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does very much so. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love your work. Thank you very much. Maybe one more question before we close for today. Oh, I'll, I'll say something. <laughs> I was gonna say, um, I love you, Leah, the video of you like on the ropes in process of making that one work sort of in that corner and just like the process of the, the work really is like speaks a lot for it. And I was gonna ask, like right now I'm sort of figuring out my own work and the scale of something makes a huge difference for me. I tend to think that bigger is better and I was wondering if you could say something to that. Like, do you feel like your larger, more installation type pieces are more impactful than the smaller ones or the smaller like stuff you do on paper or it, does it just sort of depend on what you're trying to say with it? Like, just what are your thoughts Great on that? Great question. Yeah, no, thanks, Sam. I appreciate that. Scale is yeah. also something that I really am specific about. And yeah. well, part of it was like, as a young artist in New York, there's just so much visual stimuli that I wanted to make work that like can catch your attention, right? And so that was in part like why I work with a strong graphic, you know, composition and the scale. I think for me, the scale of my work is meant to be um, specific to your body, 
to my body really, right? It's like sort of coming from me. So, so a lot of the murals and things like the piece you mentioned in the corner, it's, it's supposed to be like an environment that your body activates when you are in that space. And so it's scaled to fit a human being as sort of the little tiny person that Karen mentioned in the drawing, right? <laughs> kind of like that, but, but like you activate the pieces. And so that was kind of one reason why I like working large. And, and I think also like as a young artist, there's something about like, you know, your bravado, like, ooh, I could do it, I could do it bigger, I could do it better. I'm, I'm kind of like reeling in some of that now because I think I'm hitting a certain age where, well, one, it's very, very labor intensive. It's right. like, you just run out of energy. So like, while you're young, you gotta just do those things. And a lot of, a lot of other artists have said so to me as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, the physicality of making something that scale really shifts your mark and the energy and the kind of like gestures you can make. And so in a lot of ways, that big piece also, or many of the larger pieces, they're, they're almost easier for me to do larger than smaller. I find that trying to contain that kind of energy or that like expansiveness, which is very much about what my work deals with in terms of scale like I like to think about deep time and deep space right like things that are a little bit beyond our reality and um and for that the scale the scale helps yeah you know. for sure. thank you thanks Sam Thank you so much, Yulia, for spending um, your evening with us. This was really a lovely, lovely talk. And I so appreciated the chance to see so much more of your work. Um, the works at the Palo Alto Art Center are lovely and extraordinary. And I encourage you all to come see them in conjunction with the exhibition um, and also to visit Qualia Gallery to see Yulia's show there. Thank you everyone for joining us. Lovely to see you all. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really nice to see some friendly faces and um, in this isolated moment, it's really great to be able to share some work. Get in touch if you have any other questions or want to come over to the studio, whatever, you know. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great, have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Karen. Thank you. Nice to see you, Dacia. Yeah. <laughs>